everybody. We begin in the name of Allah, all praise and glory be to Allah and may his finest peace and blessings be upon his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his family and his companions and all those who tread his path. May Allah azza wa jal grant us and you a life upon his path and a death while adherent to his guidance and a reunion around him and a drink from his blessed hand sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the day of judgment, the day of thirst. Allahumma ameen and an opportunity to see the face of his Lord and ours, Allahumma Ameen. Jazakallah khair fami for making it clear that I'm going to be speaking about dismantling the isms. I have no intention whatsoever of dismantling the isms. <laughs> because how in the world do I do that in 20 minutes or in 20 days, right? And how do I do that when there's still more isms to come, right? And how do I do that when many of the proponents of these isms make some very valid points and they offer some very valid critiques and sometimes some very valid solutions to the very valid grievances uh, that they speak in the name of or attempt to remedy. And that's really the secret of the talk. You see, Muslims face two major challenges in light of these prevailing ideas, whenever and wherever they are, these prevailing ideologies, the isms. One challenge is to not get sucked into accepting it all wholesale, right? The bandwagon effect. You know, uh, hook, line, and sinker, they call it. Without any sort of discernment, without any sort of discretion. The other challenge is to not get sucked into or bounced into the pendulum effect. You know the pendulum on the grandfather clock? Where you categorically reject everything that is associated with that ism. Like think of liberalism for example, right? Part of the, the dominant paradigm, the lens through which people see the world today. Liberalism is pushed and understood to be necessary. Liberalism, just openness if we want to simplify terms. As the world is becoming more and more diverse and exposed to its diversity and societies are becoming more and more pluralistic, right? Openness is sort of happening naturally. Organically, it's expected you need to just be more open to more difference. But what happens when you just accept that as a superficial principle, unregulated openness? unregulated open-mindedness. Are we to be open-minded even to close-mindedness? You see the issue here? Like racism is an easy example. Should we be open to the idea that to your beliefs are yours and to my beliefs are mine, we want to just accept it all and be inclusive of it all, even if someone has this superiority complex that I'm inherently better because my skin color is X, Y, and Z? No, I would not be open to that, right? Or openness to the idea of, for example, racism was the easy one, here's a sticky one, gender non-conformism. We shouldn't define what is a man and what is a woman. Super tricky. Because you're open to the fact initially that yeah, yeah, a man is, a woman is no less, you know, human than a man. There's no difference between a woman and a man. And then you jump further and say, we should be open to the fact that a woman and a man could mean anything to anyone, then what is the, <laughs> the issue here? If we don't have definitions, then nothing will mean, everything will mean nothing. So openness to things that are incoherent becomes a problem. At the same time, on the opposite end, inflexibility, right? When you just become rigid and reject openness altogether. Like one of the trademarks of Islam, one of the hallmarks of Islam is its sense of freedom, right? Its sense of tolerance, a degree of tolerance. And this is something so beautiful about our deen that was actually exported to the rest of the world by the Islamic culture, the Islamic influence. You know, secularism, right? Sectioning off religion to one hour on Sunday or one hour on Friday and making sure it doesn't appear in public life, appear in public discourse, that was sort of seen as a necessary solution because if you say this is true and I say that is true, we're going to kill each other. It's going to get real toxic real fast. 
But in our tradition, we actually had something very different. We were not blind to the differences. We didn't bury differences. Islam makes some very unequivocal assertions. It's very assertive that this is true. Allah is one. Muhammad is his prophet. The Quran is from him. And at the same time, it gives people a degree of freedom, because why else would they be accountable if they didn't have a choice, to accept or reject the truth that I'm asserting is true. That's part of the hallmark of Islam the tolerance and freedom that the other nations of the world, even a thousand years after, couldn't work to. And so they said, let's just section off religion. Let's not assert anything anywhere. Let us be secular. That was seen as their only possible out to the inflexibility. Sometimes us Muslims as well, we sort of fall into that. We ricochet, right, from the ism and start defining Islam as the very opposite of the ism when the ism could have had some truth in it. Does that make sense? So, <clears throat> resisting the bandwagon effect, that's the first duty, right? Because if we don't resist it, what we are unintentionally implying is that Islam is basically like some homeless orphan that is shivering outside in the cold, awaiting a thousand or fifteen hundred years, right? For some movement to adopt it and take it in and define it for us, right? Islam was defined 1400 years ago, wasn't it? That is the danger. Islam is not defined, adopted. <laughs> it's not an orphan. It didn't wait for a thousand years for some man-made movement that could be responding from a good place to an injustice in some era or period of history or not. That's not Islam. Islam was perfected on the day that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed it to us. It's not a reaction or an overreaction. It's not some superficial solution to sometimes very real considerations, very real circumstances, very real injustices. And then on the opposite end, if you don't resist the pendulum effect of swinging to the opposite of all isms to define your Islam, then you haven't escaped the isms either. Because the ism is still what defined your Islam, right? You're still a captive of it. I am the opposite of the ism. So what have you really done there? Yes, Islam does not have any of the cons, the downsides of these prevailing man-made ideologies. But at the same time, Islam does also have all of the pros, all of the benefits that human beings might have just arrived at out of their nature, their love for justice, their love for goodness, their love for equality that Allah put inside us a product of human intellect, a product of human goodness. We don't believe humans are inherently evil in Islam. We believe they're inherently good, susceptible to evil, short-sighted and susceptible to evil. And so they could have arrived at some very good solutions, incomplete, but solutions. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said, I was sent to perfect good character, because a part of it could be inborn, right? And that's why Allah Azza wa Jal said, the word of your Lord, tammat kalimatu rabbika sidqan wa adila, the word of your Lord has been completed, has been perfected in truth and in justice. Meaning there's justice out there, there's truth out there, but only Allah's deen is perfectly true and perfectly just. Completely true and completely just. So that was the first leg of our journey together. The second is, now what do we do? These isms are here and people react in these, you know, very dangerous ways, the bandwagon effect, the pendulum effect. I want to show you what I think is a success story. You know, Badi'u uh, Zaman, al Nursi, the famous Turkish reformer from this past century, he lived at the heart of the, the dismantling, the destruction of the, the Khilafah, right? The, the Islamic State, the Khilafah was cancelled in his lifetime. And the colonial project and its conspiracies and its invasions and all this stuff were in full swing, right? And everyone is, is so consumed with this issue of how do we react to this new world that's, that has us down for the count because he was in Turkey. <laughs> Turkey meaning he was at the heart of the anti-religious sentiment, right? And he said something that I wish you will remember. It's a very Quranic principle. And it's no coincidence that he has his own 5,000 page commentary on the Quran. Rasail al-Nur, the messages of light, which I have a very superficial familiarity with, but it, the connection is obvious. 
He says, and remember this if you remember nothing else from the talk, نَحْنُ إِلَى بِنَاءِ الْمَعْدُومِ أَحْوَجُ مِنَّا إِلَى هَدْمِ الْمَوْجُودِ we are far more in need of building what's absent than dismantling what's present. We are far more in need as an ummah for building what's absent over dismantling what's present. And as for this being super Quranic, think about how many times the Quran has the pattern promoting the good, forbidding the evil, promoting the good, forbidding the evil, it always began with promoting the good. Because yes, you need both, but you need to prioritize promoting the good over preventing, forbidding, pushing back on, dismantling the evils. Elsewhere in the Quran, when the Prophet ﷺ was entering Mecca on the day of opening Mecca, liberating Mecca, towards the end of his life, but not quite, right? He recites the ayah, وَقُلْ جَاءَ الْحَقُّ وَزَهَقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُوقًا And say, O Muhammad وسلم, the truth has now arrived and falsehood has perished. Falsehood is bound to perish. Think about that. What do you mean falsehood is bound to perish? It's been 20 years. Why didn't it leave 20 years ago? That ayah came down around 20 years into the ministry, into the prophethood of Muhammad and what do you mean the truth has arrived? Islam was, the Quran was being revealed for 20 years. And the Quran had not fully been revealed yet. The last few years of the Prophet's life, a lot of Quran came down. So what does it mean? What's the secret here? Say the truth has now arrived in equal strength. Falsehood is flimsy. Falsehood is bound to perish. But because truth is absent in equal force, there's not a level playing field on the ground, on earth, that's why falsehood sticks around. You need to build out your truth, build out your good, in order for falsehood, which is bound to perish, perish to finally perish. That is the idea. You know, in sports, they say the best defense is a good what? Good offense, right? And in medicine, even in ancient times, they say prevention is better than a... A cure, this is just understood by everybody. And even like in management, they say that firefighting is bad management. You just keep reacting to problems, trying to dismantle and undo and put out fires. It's not sustainable, it just won't work. And then you look at the Quran again, the Quran does something profound in building the hearts and the societies of believers. The Quranic narrative focuses more on the praiseworthiness and the perfection of Allah way more than it does establish that Allah is glorified above imperfection. If you try, as the scholars did, to look at how the Quran speaks about Allah, it tells you so much more about who Allah is than who Allah isn't. And when it speaks about people that are confused about Allah or have ascribed, you know, some divine qualities to an idol or some entity or being or idea or otherwise, the Quran says what? Asma and Sammaytumuha. These gods that you called gods. No one's buying that, right? But no one's buying that, then why won't everyone just believe in Allah? No. Until you know and your heart is nourished and you are acquainted and experience the greatness of Allah, then and only then will your spirit be liberated by it. So that's why the Quran and even the Sunnah, the Prophet والسلام, said that Alhamdulillah is superior to Subhanallah. Even though you say both, they go hand in hand. The difference is Alhamdulillah establishes what? Allah is perfect. Glorified is Allah means what? Subhanallah means Allah is not imperfect. Right? So establishing His greatness is the best way to go. Otherwise, you could be validating false gods without realizing it. You could be validating, if you speak about it too much, the imperfection of the true God. You know, like if I, if I went to a king of this world and I, and I want to praise him and I praise him by negating bad qualities instead of saying, your highness, you're so amazing and you're so generous and you're so kind and please let me live, and you're, <laughs> right? If I say, you're not a trash man and you're not a loser, right? And you're not a tyrant and you're, what's going to happen? He's going to give me the extended tour of the dungeon downstairs. That's what's going to happen. Because negating the opposite too much sort of adds credence, validates the opposite. Like if it weren't imaginable, you wouldn't have spent so much time on it. 
you're, you're throwing shade here, right? It's almost like when the parent says, who ate the chocolate in the cupboard? And one of the kids says, I didn't do it. That's mighty suspicious, <laughs> right? You know, even Umar radiallahu anhu, he once charged a young poet with slander and had him punished because he said in his poetry, and my two parents are not fornicators. You know, because poets sometimes, if you're battling, right, in rap or whatever it is, right, you just got to quickly think of the next line, not too calculated, to keep the rhyme up and so on and so forth, right? And so they say things that are sometimes uh, problematic. And so he said, I didn't say they fornicate. I said, they are not fornicators. He said, you made it a conversation, right? The fact that you say my parents are not, you dismantle the suspicion when no one ever suspected them, you sort of added a layer of it's possible that they might have. You made it a conversation. You know, Ibn al-Qayyim, I add to you a few layers to this. Ibn al-Qayyim, when he speaks about an ism we should speak about more. Materialism, shopaholicism, right? He says people that love Allah and are devoted to Allah but they don't have sacred knowledge, they're not close enough to the Quran, they make a huge mistake when they try to get other people to hate the material world, hate dunya. Stay away from dunya and dunya this and dunya that, right? He said but the person who knows Allah, what they do is they don't dismantle the love of dunya, materialism. Even though dunya is wider than the material world, it is the ego and everything else, right? Your worldly reputation and otherwise. He says, but let's just simplify his materialism. They don't try to dismantle materialism. He said what they do instead is that they cultivate the love of God. Because it makes it easier for someone to temper their love for this world when their love for Allah becomes superior to their love for this world as opposed to trying to get them to hate the world that is their world. My oxygen, my trees, my nostalgia, my parents, my home, right? And so this rule of building what's absent, more so than dismantling what's present, you find it everywhere. Even when people have doubts about Islam, by the way, skepticism. You will never have the answers to every single doubt. So it's a bad strategy, try to get an answer to every single doubt. Because some doubts are not doubts. Some questions are non-questions, right? Just the question itself is wrong. Is God so powerful that he can create a circle with four corners? It's like, oh my God, it's true. No, it's not true. And it doesn't deserve an answer. Because we define objects. You tell me you want a square or a circle. And so imagine a person gets riddled with doubt and sits there for 10 years stuck on this question. And, what, and so trying to answer every doubt your life is not long enough and your brain is too finite. Some answers only the scholars know and some answers only Allah knows. So what is the better protocol to build the faith, strengthen the, abs strengthen the faith that could be absent? Its strength could be absent. Do you think I have the answer to every doubt that comes my way? I just undid the circle square thing. You think I have the answer to every single one? No, I don't. But the difference between me 20 years ago and the me now is that I can go to sleep at night now knowing why Islam is true for very good reasons even without the answer. Like you know what, I'm sure there's a really good explanation for that hadith that I never heard of before. But I'm fine, right? That is the idea. May Allah keep us all on firm faith, say Ameen. And likewise in da'wah, you know one of our teachers used to say that if you, your da'wah is to pick at and critique other people's systems, belief systems, moral systems, he says when you attack something, people get defensive and protective of it. Even if they originally believed it was worthless. Like if I had some sand in my hand, he told us, and you attack this sand in my hand, I'm gonna go. <laughs> and get protective of this, oh, this must be important, right? Maybe the stock value on sand went up or something. But if instead of attacking and trying to dismantle my attachment to sand, you present your diamonds, I'm probably going to go like this and open my hand. Right or wrong? So inviting to the truth is far more effective than you trying to respond to deconstruct these untruths. And so in terms of political justice and political systems and otherwise, world paradigms, world systems out there, we can't just critique the dominant narrative. 
This is extremely important. We have to build a superior alternative, a counter narrative, a counter culture. Once our communities, for example, and then inshallah our ummah, but it also starts before community with family and before that with individual. Once we build the representation of beauty in us, we start representing beauty. We start representing justice. We start representing compassion. We start being recognized for our concern for the world, for our progress and contributions to the world. People gravitate towards strength. Like look at athletes. Do you think we would take great pride or even know the quotes of Muhammad Ali rahimahullah or Khabib if he was 1 and 28 instead of 29 and 0? Right? We wouldn't know and we wouldn't care. Even politicians, many times people speak about these politicians, you know, and like sometimes like they think they represent the Muslim community and we can't let our, our children believe this because there's some like maneuvering that they're doing that our kids don't understand and it's mixed messaging and say, listen, they're gravitating towards strength and your children probably know that there's certain things, ABC's Islam here that are awry, but you can't stop them. People need heroes. So build the hero <laughs> and stop complaining that the anti-hero is taking someone or someone who shouldn't be a hero. It is our problem to build that representation cognitively in the minds, right? But also concretely on the ground of strength and beauty and justice and compassion and the values of our deen. The last example I'll give you because I'm out of time. You know, the Algerian writer and philosopher Malik bin Nabi, he died in, in the 70s, rahimahullah. He coined a term regarding our ummah called civilizational bankruptcy. Civilizational bankruptcy. And basically, once again, colonial project in full swing, he's one of the visionaries that said, you Muslims need to just chill out and stop whining. <laughs> I'm sorry, forgive me. Like, about these days that never existed, right? Like, things were really great until the invasions happened and the colonial powers canceled the Khilafah. Wrong. They weren't that great. They weren't. He, he's telling you this is selective memory. This is defective memory also. It's very dangerous to have this romanticized view of our history. Because it, if you think an external force is what broke Allah's promise to support the believers who are upright, then that's not the Allah we worship, right? And it means we can't solve anything because we didn't ruin anything. It was someone else who ruined everything. Stop projecting blame. He's saying our Ummah, in the political sense, was called the old man of Europe for 300 years before the Khilafah was cancelled. Right or wrong? Before the abolishment of the Khilafah. He said, you're just looking at like the, the symptom of the political debacle. Before that, there was moral corruption. There was a dismantling of our morality. And before that, the bedrock of our morality, our deen, our theology, our spirituality, our deen became more culture than, than deen, right? A commitment to Allah. Deen from debt, deen, our indebtedness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We didn't have that authentic, God-centric lifestyle. We were no longer known for this. We no longer enjoyed this. And so the morality fell. And that was just the tip of the iceberg. That was just the end result. That was the straw that broke the camel's back, which is the political system sort of got dissolved. He's saying, but we were bankrupt way before that. The fact that colonialism found a landing site for its conspiracy or found a landing site for its foreign ideas is because the Muslim heart and mind before that, he says, another term he coins, was colonizable. What made us colonizable? The vacuum inside, he says. And so that is the root cause. And the reason why we will, unless we recognize this, continue as individuals or societies be cycled through, tossed around from one ism to, to another ism, because the problem is not the ism. The problem is our vulnerability to the ism. Does that make sense? Jameel. So may Allah Azza wa Jal make us people who are self-determined to rebuild. Say Ameen. We ask Allah wa ta'ala by his most beautiful names and his loftiest attributes to make us of those who build solutions instead of just whining about problems. Allahumma ameen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us people that are better at anchoring the good 
even more so than we are at dismantling and uprooting the evil. Say Ameen. We ask Allah wa ta'ala to make us better at providing solutions for the world over describing them and observing them from the sidelines. Allahumma Ameen. May Allah make us an ummah that returns to being better at lighting candles than disapproving of the darkness. Allahumma Ameen. وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين